All right, we're going to continue our discussion on the chemistry of life. This is the last bit of material that will be on the lecture exam number one, Intro to Anatomy. And in looking at the syllabus, I was thinking, if you would rather take the lab exam number one on Intro to Anatomy this week and take the lecture exam number one next week, basically just flip-flopping the lab and the lecture exam number one, I think that would be a reasonable thing to do because I think we covered the lab material material early last week, so maybe you've had a little more time to work with that material than you have this material. So if you would like to take that lab exam this week and take the lecture exam next week, I have no problem with that. So I'll have both available for you to take, and you can choose whichever one you want to take this week, either the lab exam number one or the lecture exam number one. Whichever one you choose would be fine, but you should get one of those exams done this week one or the other will be due. Okay, so moving on then, talking about pH. pH is a measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution. So when we talk about pH, it's a range, it's a scale that ranges from, if you look on page 43 for example, it ranges from 0 to 14. 14 is the highest pH possible, and those are solutions that have a very low concentration of hydrogen ions. And something with a pH of zero would have a very high concentration of hydrogen ions. So you'll notice that the relationship between the pH and the concentration of hydrogen ions is opposite, which meaning that a low pH means a high hydrogen ion concentration, and a high pH means a low hydrogen ion concentration. If we think of what typical acids are, acids are solutions that have a high concentration of hydrogen ions. For example, they're going to have a pH anywhere from 0 to 6, or anywhere le any number less than 7. 7 is the pH of water, where we have an equal number of hydrogen ions and OH ions, which is called hydroxide ions, which you'll learn about in chemistry if you're taking chemistry or if you already took chemistry you'll have some familiarity with that but for our purposes at this level in the class all we need to know is that acids have a higher hydrogen ion concentration than bases do they have a pH less than 7 and examples of acids in the body would be our urine which is typically acidic it is around 6, but it can become more acidic if we have more hydrogen ions in the blood and, or in the plasma and that ends up in the urine, it can be more acidic. Stomach acid is one of the strongest acids known and that is important for digesting food and stomach acid has a, a pH around 2. So the lower the pH, the stronger the acid. So if we have two acids, and I say one has a pH of 5, and another one has a pH of 2, and I ask you which one has the higher hydrogen ion concentration, you would say the acid with a pH of 2, because the lower the pH, the higher the concentration of hydrogen ions. So bases, on the other hand, have a pH greater than 7, and the higher the pH, the stronger the base. Some examples of bases are sodium hydroxide or sodium bicarbonate. Sodium bicarbonate is what we see as baking soda and some people find that taking some diluted baking soda, taking a teaspoon of baking soda and dissolving it in a few ounces of water and drinking that is a really good remedy for an acid stomach. So if you've ever eaten too much junk food and or have a high amount of stress and your stomach is just feels like it's not digesting sometimes a little bit of an antacid can help correct that because that base will tie up the hydrogen ions from the acid and turn that into water creating a salt in your system again that's more chemistry than we need to know but it's important to understand that if someone has acidic conditions in the blood they're going to be treated with a base because the base will counteract the hydrogen ions in solution turning that solution into a salt and water. It's called a neutralization reaction. So commonly we treat acidic conditions in a patient by administering a base and we treat basic conditions in a patient by treating it with an acid. 
And that's not always the case, but for the most part, we can say that's true. So our, P, our blood has a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. That's a very narrow range. And seeing that that number is greater than 7, we can say that our blood is basic. Our blood is a base. So if it becomes less than 7.35, we're tipping toward the, uh, toward the acidic side of things, and that can be dangerous. So our blood is very tightly controlled by a number of factors. We have a number of what we call buffer systems in our body that help to keep our pH in that 7.35 to 7.45 range. Milk of magnesia is another example of something we might take for an acid stomach. And bleach is a popular cleaning solution that can be very corrosive, and it's a base, not an acid. Examples of acids you might see in your home would be, for example, well, oh, uh, acetic acid, which is otherwise known as vinegar. Vinegar is an acid. It has a very sour taste. Lemon juice is an acid. It has a sour taste. Bases, on the other hand, taste bitter. Like baking soda does not have a good flavor. When I said a good treatment for an acid stomach is baking soda mixed in a little water, it tastes terrible, very, very bitter, terrible taste, but it is very effective nonetheless. So acids are very sour and bases are bitter. So moving on here, I can get my screen to cooperate. Moving on to organic compounds. My screen is being a little tricky here. Organic compounds. Examples of organic compounds are any molecule that contains carbon. So these are compounds, molecules that we find in living things. Five major classes we need to be aware of are the carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, and ATP. Carbohydrates are otherwise known as sugars. They're the fuel for our cells. Lipids are also known as fats. They provide cushion for the body, and they also store fuel. If we have too many carbohydrates in our diet, we don't lose those carbohydrates. They're simply converted to fat. So that's a source of fuel storage. Proteins are very uh, popular structural materials. For example, our muscle and bone are made up of protein. Ligaments and tendons are made up of pro the protein collagen, very important structurally. And enzymes, all enzymes are proteins. And that's a very important thing to remember, that an enzyme is a protein. And what enzymes do is they speed up chemical reactions and help our metabolism occur at a 98.6 at a very efficient rate. So enzymes are proteins. Nucleic acids, we uh, have heard of those before as DNA and RNA. Those are special molecules that are, carry the information for making protein. You'll learn a lot about that in general A&P, but for our purposes, we'll just talk a little bit about DNA and RNA in terms of their ability to make protein. So they are, um, we'll talk a little bit more about them in just a little bit. And ATP is what our cells use for energy. So if a cell needs energy to drive a transport protein, then ATP is what is going to be used for that protein. And I apologize, my computer is acting up here. So carbohydrates. There's three classes of carbohydrates. Monosaccharides are simple sugars, so our cells can use this energy directly. Um, glucose is an example of the sugar that can cross our cell membranes. It can leave our blood and enter our cells very easily. Disaccharides and polysaccharides, those must be digested. Those are longer units of sugars, and they need to be broken down by digestive processes to release the simple, carbon, uh, the simple glucose units. On page 45 in your textbook, it shows a diagram of starch in the uh, letter C. You can see how many... Uh, single sugar units is uh, makes up a starch. The same is true of glycogen and cellulose. Many, many sugar use units that mis must be cleaved through digestion. The only difference is with cellulose, we cannot digest the glucose units in cellulose based on 
the chemical bond that bonds those glucose units together. Therefore, cellulose is, cellulose is what we call um, roughage. We cannot digest it. We simply eat it, and it passes through our digestive system, and we do not get the energy out of those sugar units. Starch and glycogen, however, are important storage units for um, sugar. Starch is the storage unit found in potatoes, um, rice, pasta, um, and glycogen is how we store sugar in our liver and muscles. So when we do carb loading, when you eat starches before, say, an, an athletic event, that sugar is released from those starches through digestion and the, the glucose units are stored in the liver and muscle as glycogen to be used during the athletic event the next day or the day after that. So carbohydrates are for fuel. Lipids, otherwise known as fats, are for storage and they are an important part of our plasma membranes. They are also important precursors to making hormones. Cholesterol is an important part of our hormones. I need to, I need to get that from reappearing. <coughs> um, but cholesterol is an important precursor. Okay, I feel my computer has a mind of its own here. So cholesterol is important for making hormones, the sex hormones. You can see it's this four ring structure here. That is a fat. So cholesterol is important. It gives our cell membranes strength. We don't need cholesterol in our diet because our liver makes all the cholesterol we need. But we take in cholesterol in our diet anytime we're eating an animal product. So anytime you eat eggs, meat, cheese, dairy products, those all contain cholesterol. But they are important. Cholesterol is important, like I said, for making hormones and for our cell membranes. Proteins, like we said, are structural in nature. A lot of them make up our connective tissues. Here we can see um, loose connective tissue. These pink fibers here, those are collagen, and those are proteins. So the structural strength in your skin and um, the plump of your skin is due to collagen. As we age, collagen breaks down and that causes a, and a loss of fat tissue as well causes a sagging of the skin. Here we can see this protein is acting as an enzyme. We have two molecules interacting with the enzyme and it produces something else, a whole new product. So proteins are enzymes. Very, very important that you remember that. Nucleic acids we talked about. There's DNA and RNA key thing you need to know is DNA is a double-stranded molecule found only in the nucleus. RNA is a single-stranded molecule and it's found out in the cytoplasm. It can travel into the nucleus, but it's most commonly found out in the cytoplasm. So just know the basic differences between DNA. Two-stranded in the nucleus for DNA, single-stranded in the cytoplasm for RNA. And lastly, we come to ATP. ATP, we said, is the energy currency for the cell. Again, that means that this molecule, this ATP molecule, carries energy. And the energy is found in this last phosphate bond here, this PO3 we see here. That last phosphate bond is where all the energy is, is stored in this ATP molecule. So if that phosphate is removed, that molecule becomes ADP, which means adenosine diphosphate, where there's only two phosphates. Then energy is released. When we add a phosphate to ADP, we form ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and energy is stored. So if we release a phosphate, we release energy. If we add a phosphate, we store energy. And ATP is, the, again, the energy currency for our cells. Our cells use the glucose through our diet to make ATP, and ATP is the fuel for our cells. Just like when you go to the gas station, the gas is the fuel for our for our car, so that's like the ATP for our cells, but the cash, the money, allows us to get the gas, just like glucose allows us to make ATP, and ATP is a fuel for our cells. So that concludes our discussion on the intro to anatomy and chemistry of life. Again, this is the end of the material for exam one on the lecture exam number one for Intro to Anatomy and Chemistry of Life. You have the option of taking this exam this week if you feel prepared. If you've done the Mastering A&P uh, lecture homework and you feel comfortable with the material, go ahead and test on it this week. Otherwise, if you feel more comfortable with the lab material on Intro to Anatomy, go ahead and test on that this week instead and save the lecture exam material for next week. Either way you want to do it is your choice. 
Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, and I'll be happy to go over this again with you. Have a great day.